Hello everyone. Welcome to the introductory video for Gerotic Thoughts. This video will focus on initial setup of Gerotic and how to control its GUI properly. While the program is not yet complete, it is now at a level where it is useful and it can slowly begin to replace Gerotic Motion, uh, which will no longer be downloadable once Gerotic Thoughts has developed uh, to where it offers all the options currently in Gerotic Motion. That won't happen for a few months, so don't be uh, scared of Gerotic Motion disappearing. Um, what you see here is the main screen layout. Just prior to this screen, you'll be presented with a tip of the day when you start the program. Uh, that can serve to sometimes teach you a little trick you may not have known about the program. That tip will last for five seconds or until you press OK. You can also check a box on the tip screen to disable that feature in future. OK, onto the main screen. This screen remembers almost everything you do, so if you set something to a setting you like, it will probably stay that way till you change it. The items in the program do that. Uh, most of the items in the program do that as well, except in instances where I thought it might lead to trouble. Let's start by looking at our main menu. It's a bit different format than you may be used to. The large globe icon up here is a menu selector. If you press the Alt key on your keyboard, you'll find that it lights up. I don't know if you can see it in the video, but now we have a letter M and uh, the numbers 1 through 5 on some icons up here. Pressing the letter M or clicking on the globe, of course, uh, will open up this menu and give you some uh, normal options that I think you can pretty easily uh, figure out. Uh, new, save, uh, save as, etc. Also, there's uh, five icons at the top of the uh, screen. Uh, those are configurable, and we'll get to that in a second. You'll notice uh, one of the numbers, Alt-5, for example, uh, will give you a full screen toggle, which gives you a nice empty screen in case you're trying to visualize something that's hard to uh, get a visual on. Going Alt-5 will toggle you back to the way you were as well. I use the Alt-1 key up here as a quick uh, erase and it will delete everything on your screen in case you're uh, just playing around. Okay, one of the most important buttons up here is this one that's shaped like a gear. It is your options button and if we uh, open this up and take a look you'll see here you can configure various system options. One idea you may want to consider if you're like me is to have a folder called gear data on your desktop. I do that so I can easily reach the gears I make for each uh, for use with other programs. Of course everyone has their own favorite methods but I'll uh, show you how I did mine as, as we set up this system here. First, I create a folder on my desktop called Gear Data. Uh, then we just press the Browse button here on the options. We browse up to the desktop. And my system's a little slow because it's got a lot of stuff in it. Well, once we go to the desktop and bring it to that level, we can then find uh, Gear Data in the list and click it and that will set from then on the system will save any output including project files etc into that folder on your desktop um, that sometimes makes it a little easier to find things uh, of course this method would drive some people nuts as they like a clean desktop but uh, uh, as you can see I'm not one of those people who likes a clean desktop so anyway let's go back to our options um, here we can set our uh, inch or millimeter units. I usually use millimeters, so my apologies to the fact inch users sometimes see bugs I don't find because of that. But I do try to test an imperial and metric both, so I think what we've um, done pretty well with this version. Most of the selections other than this can be left alone, but you should at least be familiar with them so you know why something is happening. For example, you can see here that spokes are disabled on any gear less than 25.4 uh, millimeters in radius. This stops that annoying habit of having spokes appear on a gear that are way too small to cut them on. So if you find you're not getting spokes on some small gear, this would be why it's being disabled. Um, also, here you can set the epilogue and prologue code that's going to be put out in your CNC files. Uh, you can set the default material of the various gears and such that you can build. Uh, for example, here we can see Evolut gears are currently set to black rubber, but you could actually set them to any one of a great number of uh, 
materials and you can set each type of object uh, to whatever material you like. When you select the object, the material will change to its current selection. Um, here you can turn on or off startup tips in case you've disabled them because you found them annoying or something. You can always turn them on again there if you like. Um, the extrusion slice distance, this um, number at the bottom is extrusion slice, is how many slices a complex object like a helical gear is made of. Uh, for example, a helical here would have one millimeter thick slices, well, 1.02 millimeters. This will change if you were in inches to something like 0 0.05 inches. Uh, this means that a helical gear, because of course you're doing many slices as you extrude it into depth, uh, I will only in metric uh, do it every millimeter so that I don't end up with uh, 50 megabyte helical gears, for example. And then on the left here, uh, we have all the colors. Uh, you can set colors of the screens, of um, your tool paths on your CNC control as well. And you might want to check the screen whenever there's a new option because, uh, or whenever there's a new version because new options will be added to the screen over time. Okay, beneath this is the ribbon bar. Let's take a look at each item here in turn. Uh, on the ribbon bar on the top are various menus most users are already familiar with, I think. The first panel gives you options to turn on or off the tool and project windows, as well as the status bar, but the status bar uh, really isn't used uh, at the moment. Um, you can turn them on or off with the check boxes and bring them back. As you can see, it's easy enough to get them to go, or you can, as we talked about earlier, use your Alt-5 key and uh, switch to a full screen from a half screen. Um, next we have uh, the simulation panel where of course you can hit simulate reverse reset will rotate a simulation back to its initial start position in case things have moved um, to new positions uh, we have a simulation speed as uh, in GM and of course you can click on the plus or minus to slowly increase or decrease your speed or just grab the slider to get an abrupt change we have a reverse, you can go in the opposite direction. And uh, New is this audio button which um, you can use to turn off the audio if you find it annoying. Basically the program will do ticks and talks like it did before for escapements, but it also gives some warning messages uh, and audible alerts with them. So again, you can use that to uh, kill that if you find it annoying. Okay, next we have spokes. A few changes here as well. In fact, you'll find changes just about everywhere uh, GT does, in everything GT does, because this is all new code. This is not just a new GUI. Everything's been rewritten here to make it more accurate, so you're going to find quite a bit has changed. Here in the spokes, you'll see there's quite a bit uh, of new types of spokes. Uh, we're going to be adding spokes faster and faster, I think. We've come up with a way of adding uh, new spokes on the fly, uh, as well as indicators and probably escapement types. Uh, so you're going to see this grow. Some, some types of, um, of spokes, like the first nine or ten spokes up to foam are the old spokes. All the new ones can be a bit harder to control in terms of their leg ratios and boss ratios and such. And some you're going to find you couldn't cut without a laser uh, or a 3D printer. But in the future we won't worry so much about whether you can cut it in CNC. It will be try to be an even mix of CNC, laser, 3D printing types and so on and so forth just to give people more options. Also here you'll find that uh, we have a shaft type. You can now select round, square, pentagon, hexagon, and octagon. Um, some people like different shaft shapes because for example if you have a uh, hex shaped stock if you had a hex shaped hole in the gear the gear would be frozen to the shaft but a round hole would probably uh, turn quite nicely on a hexagon shaft so having different shaft shapes can be handy. Next to that we have a coordinates display with real-time coordinates. You can see it moving around as I move my mouse. And then a perspective screen which will change the perspective of uh, which way you're looking at the screen. We'll touch on that later as well as the final panel which is our output options which again we won't touch until we have a few examples uh, to show you their use. So on the left side of the screen here we have a project screen and a tool uh, screen. You can see I'm flicking between the two. First let's look at the project screen. It has a drop box at the top where you can select how you want your project to show up. 
you can see I have select by shaft uh, selected or sort by shaft selected and I would advise you to do the same it is the easiest way to look at your project next we have a button that turns on or off the selection of uh, gears on the screen you should probably have it turned on and it's on when it is uh, surrounded with uh, yellow now one of the first things we should do with our main screen here is make sure that it's set up right for your system uh, first go to the tools uh, tab on the tab and grab the bar which is going down the screen and drag it back and forth until it's just showing all the buttons like right to the edge where I just put mine uh, the system will remember that and from now on whenever you start the program will go there and similarly on the bottom let's just grab that bar and you can see I can move it up and down you're gonna wanna move it until you can see everything on the screen the selections that you have at that point the system will remember it and you should be fine okay so now we're set and our project tree is uh, ready to go and it will grow of course as we add objects um, before we look at tools those let's look at the bottom button bar where you can see how there is a log tab and at the moment it just says engine in idle state this log will fill up as you do things um, as you create other uh, objects and uh, add other messages it'll help us in diagnosing and debugging uh, so we'll leave it on the screen until at least we're out of beta. Uh, we'll ignore it for now for the most part. You can also see a tab called Selected Props. This is a tab that you're going to use a lot. It is the main tab that will be on the screen. It allows for the manipulation of any running project. Uh, you can change a gear in a project. You can delete a gear. You can move gears around. And this is the screen that you'll use for all those things. Uh, finally, the last thing to look at is the toolbar on the left. The toolbar is where um, uh, all our buttons for creation tools can be seen. Only the tools created so far are lit up, though. Uh, GM will be fully replaced when all these buttons are lit up. Eventually, icons will appear for them as well, of course. Um, let's look at a real simple item. Let's add a pulley as a test so here I've gone to the pulley screen you can see that we have a hexagonal shaft in this pulley because when we were playing with spokes we left it on hexagon and transfer that back to uh, round uh, you can see it's a very simple screen we have regen just in case it looks to you as if uh, something isn't uh, kosher you can use your mouse wheel to uh, zoom it in and out you can pan it with your uh, right mouse button um, You'll notice you can't rotate. There is no sense in rotating a 2D structure like this. And you can tell that you can't rotate because there's no head on the screen. On any screen in Garotic Thoughts where you can rotate, that little head, uh, headly screen, gear head, will appear up in the uh, left-hand corner. If there's no gear head up there, uh, then you cannot rotate. So again, you can go through the uh, pulleys and select uh, various types and so on. So let's... Uh, select one. You can see this pulley got large enough that it just exceeded the one inch radius so the spokes turned on automatically. Uh, let's generate that pulley. Let's just uh, give it a couple more teeth and add it to the project. So here we have our pulley. It's created. Its default material is by the look of it uh, silver um, and that was set that way in the options tab. There's a setting for it. Oh it's an emerald actually. I don't know why that's emerald. I don't know. Um, so uh, the gear is on the screen. If we select it on the tree, you can see that we'll get some text that defines it, and it will turn blue to tell us that it is selected. Let's go back and select another one and say Add to Project. So written at the bottom of the screen in red at the moment, it says Pick Object, so, and that is where the status messages for modality specific messages will appear. In this case, we're being told to uh, pick an object to mesh this gear with. We could, for example, pick the shaft or the pulley. Right above pick object in blue is a picker message telling us what we're pointing at. If I point at the shaft, you'll notice it says shaft. That's not just telling me it's a shaft. That's actually the name of the object, which you can see over here in the project tree. The first shaft is named shaft, appropriately enough. So we're either pointing at the shaft or we're pointing at that pulley. If I point at the shaft and click, I will now go to placing my pulley on the shaft. Now you notice I can only go so far before I hit the top or bottom. 
So rotating the mouse wheel will allow me to zoom out so I can place it further away. I also get a message telling me how far from shaft center, and the shaft center at the moment is in the center of the other gear, uh, we are. So we can pick a distance between that we are putting things. And there we have it, two pulleys. So we placed a pulley on the uh, shaft, set distance apart. If we hit simulate, they both go, of course. Let's add one more pulley. The system will leave the pulleys tab down here for you, so you can always go back to add another pulley just by going to pulleys again. One thing about uh, Garotic Thoughts is it always wants no more than three tabs at the bottom, so that pulleys tab will disappear if you go to another tool or if you select an output option. Otherwise, you can always go back to pulleys just by clicking on it, saying add to project 10. We're back to adding one. It's asking me to pick an object, and this time I'm going to pick the pulley. Again, I can use my mouse wheel to zoom out and in as I move the gear around for placement. And you'll see now, because I'm placing it on another pulley, that I will be told the number of teeth that such a uh, that the belt would have to have in order to place the gear there. Right there it says 32.07 teeth, um, 24.9 teeth, etc. Um, just a piece of advice, I would keep that number small. If you have a 28-tooth uh, tooth belt, you may want to make that 27.4 teeth for placement, and then place it. And here we can see we now have three um, timing gears, and even though no belt is in, the system will assume that there's a belt and allow one uh, pulley to turn the other. You'll also notice, looking over at the project tree, but the three pulleys now have different names. Uh, it will increment the pulley, add a number to it if it sees a pulley of the same name or any gear of the same name. Garotic Thoughts will not allow two gears to have the same name. Uh, it would be a drastic bug if something like that were to happen. So let me know if you see such a thing. Okay, let's delete this and start over again so we can show some more important concepts. I usually use this uh, single page up here that create a new document as my quick delete so that I can delete everything off of the screen to start over when I want to uh, when I'm playing around I want to start a new concept. <laughs> okay, before we get into all the gear types, let's talk about linkages. GT uses new rules. Let's face it, without the rules all this would be too complex and it would take you hours just to get three or four gears turning together. I use rules to limit how complex the things you make are. This makes it possible to design complexity without having to be a master at CAD CAM and all that kind of stuff. So the new design rule is very important to understand and if you understand this rule you'll find you can do many things others can't in Garotic Thoughts. It's all about this one master rule and then an understanding of linkages. Okay, the master rule is this. An object may drive many objects, but it may be driven by only one. That is to say, any gear or any object uh, can drive a whole lot of other objects, but only can be driven by one object. Let's take a look at what I mean. Here is a sample uh, gear train on the screen. This one I've just highlighted as our master, uh, just so you know where we're at. Okay. Um, in the future, the one you place first will not necessarily be the master, but let's go with that for now because that still is the case. The one you press first is the master. Now you notice whenever we're playing with gears, the properties tab is usually up. Uh, the system will put up the tab that it thinks is most important at the time for you to deal with. It will only allow three tabs at the bottom. As you switch tools, uh, one tool will disappear and another one will appear. Um, so at the moment the properties tab is on the screen and it tells us a few interesting things and allows us to do a few interesting things. Um, you could respoke any gear that you select for example or you could uh, move a gear and other gears with it uh, on the screen as a flow. But let's learn a bit about linkages before we get too complex uh, because this can get confusing and you really have to understand this rule. Here we have our master gear and we have a box called linkages down here. It says this gear links to the following. Think of links as drives. So this gear drives three things. First, it drives the object named shaft, which is the shaft it's sitting on. So that's kind of appropriate. The gear is magically being given energy by the system 
and it has to disperse that energy. It's going to disperse it by turning the shaft that it sits on. Um, it's also going to turn spur 1, which would be this gear, and spur 2, or spur 3, this gear over here. Uh, but it's only being driven by the system. Now, this gear then is driving, as we said, um, spur 3, which is right beside it. And spur 3 is driving shaft number 3, which it sits on, and spur 4 and 5, which is logical. So here we have a gear driving many other objects. It's driving these two objects and being driven by one other object, this one. So it fits our rule that a gear may drive many other objects, in this case these two, but may be driven only by one, in this case this gear. And when we hit simulate, the system uses that knowledge to make everything go. Well, let's delete a gear to see if we can figure out what I mean here. I'm going to delete this gear, which I just highlighted, spur number three. And on the screen, on the prop screen, there's a button, delete. We're going to hit delete. It says, are you sure? Yes. Now, it also notice that the shaft is no longer in use. And it's asking us if we want to remove it because it's no longer in use. It's up to you. I'm going to say yes. It's gone. Okay, we just deleted a gear out of a running gear train. What happens if we simulate? Of course, only the first two gears rotate. Um, that's to be expected, because after all, there's nothing driving them. There's no linkage. If we hit this gear here, we can find it now drives shaft 1 and spur 1, which is this gear here. There is no connection to uh, spur 4 or spur 5. So let's create one. We can go to uh, the gear that we want to drive those gears. In this case, let's pick spur and say add ink. We're going to select add linkage. When we select add linkage, the system looks through and says, what gears are not being driven by something? Because as we already mentioned, a gear may drive many things, but it can only be driven by one. You're telling the system that you want this gear we currently have selected. Uh, to drive something. So the system looks through all the gears that are on the screen and says which gears are not currently being driven. Well in this case gears 4 and 5, neither one of them are being driven uh, because we deleted their driving gear. So let's select, now if only one gear had been found the system would automatically pick it for you and wouldn't give you the choice. But in this case it sees two and it says which one do you want to create a driving linkage to? We'll select gear number 4. When we do that, gear number four now appears meshed to gear number one, and it's asking you to place it. You place the gear, and now if we hit simulate, there is a linkage between those gears, and we still have an orphan. So what we could do is select that uh, gear at the end and say, add a linkage to that one in which case it will automatically select the last gear which had no drive linkage and we now have four gears and we've deleted a gear. They may not be in the positions you want them to be in, in which case you can select a gear and say move it and then move the gear and gears that are connected to it will move with it. So then if you want to change the position of uh, one single gear on it. That allows you to reconfigure your gear train uh, to ver do various things. As long as you follow that golden rule, a gear may drive many gears, but may only be driven by one. If you keep that in mind and remember that linkages are what that gear is driving, you'll find you can delete and move things around quite well uh, just by using a little bit of logic. Okay, here is a more complex um, geared object. You can see that it's going off at several different angles. Uh, there are angled helicals and bevels on here and things are moving around. Um, you'll see that the linkages, however, all follow the standard rule. For example, this bevel I've just selected drives only one shaft. Although it's capable of driving more, it's only hooked to one shaft. If we look at the shaft, to do that we may have to select it in the tree. Shafts can be a little hard to connect depending on what gears are around them. But the shaft then tells us it's linked to the helical. If we go to the helical, the helical tells us it's connected to helical 1. And so up the chain, we can follow each object and see what it's connected to. You will never find a gear 
which is driven by more than one, but you will find gears which drive several. Moving gears can do things that are a little unexpected to you. For example, here I've selected a bevel, and I'm going to say move it on the wheel, or move it on the gear. You can rotate the screen while you place such an object, but you'll notice some of the effects can be a little strange. This is because the gears are trying to maintain their initial set position while rotating and keeping themselves in mesh. So you may end up moving stuff around a lot in order to f get to exactly where you want to be uh, when you're reconfiguring any type of mechanism or recentering stuff inside a clock. 